And I am so glad to have my family with me here this morning. Uh, my wife, Wendy, and our uh, two oldest children, they're seated right there in the middle. Wendy, if you can just wave at everybody there. So good to have my family with me. I'm not able, able to always travel together with them, or they're not able to always travel together with me, but they're here with me this morning. My family and I, we have been missionaries to Tanzania since 2001, and we are grateful to be New Hope's missionaries to Tanzania. My wife, Wendy, she came to Christ when she was five years old, and that same year was called to be a missionary through her church's bus and children's ministry. I came to Christ during vacation Bible school in the summer following my kindergarten year. I was called into full-time ministry in second grade. And then as I entered into eighth grade, the Lord spoke to my heart and let me know that he was calling me to be a missionary. When we made our way to Tanzania, uh, we had two children. Michaela was eight year, uh, Michaela was two years old, and Skylar, he was just nine months old. Since making our way to Tanzania, our family has grown from two children to five children, and we have another little girl who's on the way. Kara Faith will be here around November the 19th. So what we're basically doing, we're balancing our family out with three boys and three girls, and I want you to know we are through. <laughs> we're done. <laughs> We thank God for what he's doing in our family. God did something marvelous in our family this past term. The Lord spoke to Michaela's heart in 2012 and called her to be a missionary to India. That same year, he spoke to Skylar's heart, called him to be a missionary to China. Our third child, Zachary, last year, in the summer of last year, the Lord spoke to his heart and called him to be a church planter here in the United States. And then in September of last year, our fourth child, Christiana, she's just seven years old, the Lord spoke to her heart through a dream and called her to be a missionary to Somalia. And our youngest, Enoch, he's two years old. We think he's going to be a fiery evangelist, but he's just two years old. You know what I'm talking about this morning. <laughs> Well, I want to talk to you from Luke chapter 11. I mean, I'm sorry, from Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. And I want to talk to you about Christ, the hope of the nations. If you will, turn in your Bibles with me this morning to Luke chapter 5. We're going to start at verse 1 and make our way through verse 11. Looking at Christ, the hope of the nations. The scripture says in Luke chapter 5 verse 1 that on one occasion while the crowd was pressing in on Jesus to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret or the lake of Galilee and he saw two boats by the lake but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land and he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing. But at your word, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon these words. And they're words that we need to hear this morning. The wor these are words that the world needs to hear. Jesus said, do not be afraid. When we have Jesus in the boat with us, we have no reason to be afraid. When we're living his vision and his dream, forsaking our own, we have no reason to be afraid. The message of the kingdom of God today for all generations is peace be unto you. Do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and they followed Jesus. Lord, we just thank you for your precious presence that's here in this place. Lord Jesus, there is no one like you. Lord, you are the creator of the ends of the earth. You're the savior of the world. You left the glories of heaven and you came into this sin-filled, evil, wicked world. Lord, you lived, you died. 
and you rose again. And you are exalted to the right hand of the Father, sending to us your Holy Spirit so that you might walk into our empty lives and fill us. So that you might come in and drive out the evil things that are lurking around within us so that we might be your people. You desire for us to be your sons and your daughters, God. I just pray, Lord, that you would work your good work in our hearts this morning. Lord, I pray that you would open our blinded eyes, that you would unstop our deaf ears, that you would soften our hardened hearts, Lord. And may we be all that you are calling us to be, transformed by your Holy Spirit. Lord, we just thank you for this time together, sitting at your feet. We give you all the praise and all the glory. We ask these things in your holy name. Amen. And amen. I want to take you this morning to the country of Tanzania. Some of you may not know where Tanzania is. Tanzania is in East Africa. It is south of Kenya and north of Malawi and Mozambique. It's right on the Indian Ocean. My family and I, we have lived in the center of Tanzania since 2002 in the little town of Dodoma, which if you're an Andy Griffith fan, we call it the Mayberry of Tanzania. But Dodoma is also the capital of Tanzania with less than 400,000 residents. I mean, you can drive from one side of Dodoma to the other in just two minutes, or you used to, until we put our first traffic light up last year. Now it takes about three minutes to get from one side to the other. <laughs> There in Tanzania, we have the snow-capped peaks of Mount Kilimanjaro, which is the highest point on the continent of Africa. And then there's the Serengeti, which is teeming with all kinds of wildlife. And then there's the Ngorogoro Crater, which is a volcano that imploded. And at the bottom of that crater are all kinds of wildlife. And the country of Tanzania is rich in gold and diamonds and Tanzanite, the only country in the world that Tanzanite comes from, from Tanzania. But I want you to know that in the midst of all of this beauty, there's a grim reality. You see, about 35% of the population are Muslim. If you were to take all of the Muslims on the continent who live south of the equator and outside the borders of Tanzania, they will not equal the number of Muslims who live in the country of Tanzania. And then about 35% of the people are nominal Christians. But Tanzania leads the African continent in witchcraft with many who call themselves Christians still visiting witches. And about 20% of the population are pure animists. These are those Tanzanians who practice their traditional religions. They worship the spirits of their dead ancestors. They worship the spirits in the rocks, the trees, the rivers, you name it. They worship it. And all of this is happening in the midst of challenging realities across the continent of Africa. There's an aggressive push for the Islamization of Africa with, with much pressure being put on the Tanzanian government to join the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, or as we say for short, OIC. And more than 700 people groups are considered unreached with basically no indigenous Christian witness living among them. In other words, there are no believers from among these people groups. Think about that. No believers, no churches, no pastors. I believe this morning that Christ is calling out across this congregation with the same call that came to Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6. Who will go? Who will go? Who will go? This represents almost 200 million people on the continent of Africa. And the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the God of the universe, he is here this morning and he's calling out to you and to me. And he's saying, who will go? Who will go? 24 of these unreached people groups, or as we say for short, UPGs, are found in Tanzania. If you talk with many of our uh, African Assemblies of God leaders, they will tell you that the number one need on the continent is leadership. You see, we just came through an era in which Gaddafi was the African Union president and his assistant was the former Tanzanian president. During this era in 2010, President Kikwete and Gaddafi, they partnered together to build in Dodoma, the Mayberry of Tanzania, the second largest mosque in East Africa. Why? It's the capital of the country. As we all know, poverty and suffering rule the day. 
across the continent. Many in Tanzania make less than $5 a month getting water from open, hand-dug, dirty, disease-infested water wells. I'm so grateful that New Hope is partnering with us to see water wells drilled there in Tanzania and across the continent. Thank God for Speed the Light. And our TAG pastors and members in the village of Nguji, they walk 24 kilometers round trip to get water from these wells. And they make this trip almost every day. And then there's the youth who are at great risk. You see, more than 12 million children have been orphaned on the continent because of AIDS. In Tanzania alone, 65% of the population is under 25 years of age as compared to the U.S. where 33% of the population are under 25. By 2030, more than 60% of the population of Africa will live in urban centers. In Dar es Salaam, the major city of Tanzania, more than 70% of the population live in slum-like conditions. But I want you to know that in the midst of these dark realities, which oppressively tower over Tanzania as Goliath did over Israel, the Lord has raised up the Tanzania Assemblies of God for such a time as this. And we're so grateful that New Hope is partnering with us. In 2009, the Tanzania Assemblies of God, or as we say for short, the TAG, together with us as missionaries, we repented of our sins of complacency, apathy, pride, and arrogance. We stopped patting ourselves on the back, allowing ourselves to remain blind to the lostness that surround us. And we humbled ourselves under the Lordship of Christ in our brokenness. And the Lord spoke to our TAG leadership and gave to us what we call the 10-year strategic plan, which we launched in 2009. And in this plan, we purpose to see 2 million new adults, 4 million children, 10,000 pastors, and 10,000 churches added to the Tanzania Assemblies of God. Let me just say that such a vision and passion for the nations define our lives when we catch a new glimpse of Christ. When we catch a new glimpse of Christ, who is the hope of the nations. You see, the TAG needed a fresh glimpse of who Jesus is. Like Peter in Luke 5, 1 through 11, the TAG had worked all night catching nothing. We had no clear vision and no clear strategy that unified us as a church to reach the nations. But we had many failed plans for church growth that primarily focused on individual TAG churches. We were surrounded by the nations as Peter was surrounded by the crowds in Luke 5.1. But we were so focused on our everyday responsibilities as Peter was with washing his nets that we could not see the nations who were pressing in around us and who needed to hear the word of God. We had become good at washing our nets and oblivious to the lost people who surrounded us. We had members in our churches whom Christ had called to reach the nations, but our pastors were not recognizing Christ's call on their lives, and were not releasing them to be pastors and to plant churches in the darkness of Tanzania. Our pastors were keeping these members instead in their grip for their own purpose of maintaining the daily operations of their local churches. But when we caught a glimpse of Christ's glory as Peter did, we moved from focusing on what we were doing as a church to what, what Christ wanted to do among the nations. You see, it's not about our dream. It's not about our vision. It's about his dream. It's about his vision. It simply started with a step of obedience in response to Christ who first came to us in grace and truth. Christ asked Peter to launch out in his boat, and he did. But this time, in obedience to Christ among the crowds. Christ asked the TAG to strategize once again. But this time, in obedience to Christ with the nations in focus. Christ asked us to redefine our lives around him in his vision of the earth being filled with the knowledge of his glory as the waters cover the sea. It then progressed to a step of faith in response to Christ's command, contrary to what was known and understood. Peter knew that his fishing efforts had been futile. 
And he understood that another cast in the middle of the, of the day, out in the deep, would be a waste of time yielding no results. And the TAG knew that our planning efforts had been futile. And we understood that a 10-year strategic plan would appear to many as a waste of time requiring an impossible amount of sacrifice and funding more than any previous plan had required. But Christ commanded Peter to cast his nets out in the deep, in the middle of the day. And because Christ commanded the TAG to strategize with no funding in sight, we took that step of faith. Let me ask you this morning, what step of faith is Christ calling you to take that goes against everything that you know and understand? You see, when we take a step of faith and obedience to Christ, we will see the glory of God. Both Peter and the TAG had an Isaiah 6 moment. Just as Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up, so also Peter and the TAG saw the Lord in all of his glory. Peter watched in amazement as his nets were tearing from a miraculous catch. The TAG watched in amazement as 100% of our pastors embraced the strategic plan, releasing and supporting church planters to pastor and plant churches. Seeing, God, seeing the glory of God results in us being transformed to a new life of holiness, worship, and missions. The three are inseparably intertwined. In the same way that Isaiah recognized and confessed his sinfulness and was touched, cleansed, and made holy by Christ, so also did Peter and the TAG recognize their sinfulness and were made holy by Christ. If we could describe God using one word to encompass all of his attributes and characteristics, love, merciful, gracious, kind, righteous, just, that one word would be holy. And Christ, who is holy, calls us to be holy as he is holy. You see, holiness is foundational to worshiping God. For worship is always an outgrowth of Christ's holiness in us. Christ always calls us to go from where he is worshipped to where he is not worshipped so that those in that place where he is not worshipped might worship him. You see, Christ calls us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And the moment he saves us is the moment his call comes upon our lives to preach the gospel. We're called to go back out into the darkness. Not to sin as we once did, but to stand in that darkness as the light of the world and unashamedly and boldly declare and proclaim that Jesus Christ is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, that he is our Savior. He's the hope of the nations. So holy lives of worship are missional lives. In other words, holy lives of worship are always in pursuit of Christ's mission of reaching the nations with his gospel. The stone's been rolled away. We've had an opportunity to look inside that empty tomb and to realize that Jesus is risen from the dead. He's come to bring hope into the lives of our families, into the lives of our communities, into the lives of those with whom we work, in the lives of those with whom we go to school. He wants us to be his witnesses, his people called by his name, proclaiming his good news. Both Isaiah and Peter heard God's call to reach the nation, to fish for men, and they left everything to do so. In the same way the TAG saw Christ's glory, they heard his call, and they went to tell the nations. It's the seeing and the hearing that results in the going and the telling. It's good news that can't be kept secret. May we as new hope have eyes to see and ears to hear Christ so that we might go and tell this world that he is indeed the hope of the nations. When we launched the TAG strategic plan in 2009, we had 132,000 adult members, 400,000 children, 2,600 pastors, and 2,800 churches. Today, in uh, as of the end of last year, the Tanzania Assemblies of God has grown 
to over 800,000 adult members, to almost 2 million children, and to over 8,000 pastors and churches. You see, our clarion call as the TAG is Tanzania for Jesus. Hallelujah. And we won't rest, we won't sleep, and we won't slumber until this is a reality. Until Tanzania is reached for Jesus. It's a reality that you, Pastor Weaver, and New Hope Assembly of God are a part of through your gracious and generous partnership. You have helped us drill water wells throughout the country. I'm telling you, we go into places, some of the hardest places to reach among our Muslim friends. They won't let us go in there and build a church, but they will let us drill a water well. And when we drill that water well and we start providing the people that water, they come and they invite us to build a church there in their village. They allow our pastors to go anywhere in the village and preach the gospel. What you are doing together with the youth through Speed the Light is making a world of difference an eternal difference in the lives of Tanzanians all over the country of Tanzania. You partnered with us to expand our Bible colleges with a four-story, 250-student dormitory at Central Bible College in Dodoma. You are helping us to build 33 church-planting school campuses from which more than 5,000 newly called pastors, I'm talking about men and women, both young and old, have graduated from these church planting schools since 2010, 5,000 of them. And most of these graduates have already planted their first church and some are planting, already planting two and three other churches. You see, we believe that just as humans give birth to humans, disciples of Christ should give birth to other disciples, pastors should give birth to other pastors, and churches should give birth to churches. For this reason, Every member of the TAG is mandated by the 10-year strategic plan to reach and disciple at least one other Tanzanian each year. Every pastor is to raise up and mentor at least one other pastor every three years. And every church is to plant at least one other church every three years. Some of our churches are planting as many as 30 churches per year. The TAG strategic plan has also influenced the U.S. Assemblies of God world mission in Africa. Because of the TAG's visionary leadership under our general superintendent, Dr. Barnabas Mtokambali, AGWM Africa has started what we call the Lordship and Lostness process, through which we are more strategically using our missionary resources under Christ's Lordship to engage the lostness of Africa. You see, there was a day when the African church was sitting at the feet of the missionaries, learning from them. But as you can see, we as missionaries today, we are sitting at the feet of our African Assemblies of God leaders and pastors, and we're learning from them. Since 2010, AGWM leaders and missionaries have been reevaluating their effectiveness on the continent and strategically reengaging from areas of less effectiveness to areas of greater effectiveness. You see, we don't want to be like a candle burning in the noonday sun. Rather, we want to be a light shining in the darkness of Africa. As we look forward to our work in Tanzania through the lenses of the Lordship and Lostness process and the TAG strategic plan, the Lord is speaking to our hearts as a family. As a family, we have four strategic priorities. It was at 10.30 p.m., New Year's Eve night, that the Tanzania Assemblies of God General Superintendent Dr. Barnabas Mtokambali called me as he made his way to his church's all-night prayer meeting. He asked us as we were getting ready to return to the States for furlough, he asked us to consider moving from Dodoma to Dar es Salaam, which is about a, a, an 11-hour move, so that we can be closer to the TAG headquarters and work more closely with him and all that the TAG is doing with their 10-year strategic plan. And unbeknownst to Dr. Mtokambali, our AGWM leadership had already granted us approval two months prior to make that move. So we are moving to the heart of Dar es Salaam, right in the middle of what is called city center. 
Our first two strategic priorities are partnering with the TAG to reach the Gujarati and Punjabi Indians of Tanzania and to plant an urban church among them at city center in Dar es Salaam. The Punjabi and Gujarati Indians of Tanzania are probably the most difficult people for our TAG brethren to reach because of the racial wall of animosity that stands between the Indian Tanzanians and the African Tanzanians. My family and I, we spend time with our Indian friends. We visit with them in their homes and at their workplaces. I mean, the whole family, all seven of us, we go into their little shops and we sit there many times. We sit there for one to two hours. We listen to them about their lives. We share with them from the scriptures and pray with them. They don't realize it that whenever they bring out the sodas and the cookies, we're actually having communion. We're just inviting the presence of God into that little place where we're meeting with them. Most of our Indian friends, they are Hindus. One of our Indian friends named Jay wrote and emailed us a letter this past July after we returned here to the States for furlough. In it, this is what he wrote. He said, I miss all of you very much. I miss your friendship and the courage you gave me. You gave me advice which I will never forget the rest of my life. You have prayed many times for me. Please keep on praying for me and my children. As you know, I am a totally broken-hearted man. I am destroyed. You see, Jay has told us on numerous occasions that he is nothing but a loser because his wife no longer loves him. Jay is a Hindu, and he has simply added Jesus to the shelf of his hundreds of gods. Jay is struggling to let go of his other gods because these are the gods of his deceased mother whom he loved dear, dearly. The reality is that the Punjabi and Gujarati Indians are just as lost today as they were before we started the TAG strategic plan. We've had all of this success. We've accomplished so much. And yet there the Punjabi and Gujarati Indians sit just as lost as they were before we started the plan. Sitting there, lost under the shadow of the T-A-G steeple. The Gujarati and Punjabi Indians, they need your prayers. We as the T-A-G, we're not focused on what we have accomplished. We're focused on the unfinished task that Christ has placed within our hands to accomplish. Most of the Indian community in Tanzania live in city center Dar es Salaam with more than 60,000 Indians living there. We want to live among them so that when we walk out the door of our house, we are right there with them. Most of the Indians speak Hindi, and we will plant a Hindi-speaking church among them. If we go in there trying to plant a church uh, preaching in Swahili, which is the national language of Tanzania, or, or preaching in English, we'll get everybody but the Indian community. So we're going to be making our way to India for five months, going to language school to learn Hindi, so that we can reach the Indian Tanzanians together with our TAG brethren. But we must be strategic in how we plant this church because the Indians will see us as a threat to their Hindu temple. So we will purchase a four-story building downtown. The top floor will be our house. The next floor will be a secret church. The second floor will be a Hindi-speaking nursery school. And the first floor will be some kind of business catering to the Indian Tanzanians. And we can purchase such a building in downtown city center Dar es Salaam for just $100 per square foot. Our goal is to establish a missionary sending Indian district in the TAG. We want to reach India and Africa. It's not just about planting a church among them. It's about planting churches and seeing the church among the Indians established. So by 2033, we purpose to see the first Indian TAG missionary sent out to another country. And the first Indian Tanzanian serving on the executive committee of the Tanzania Assemblies of God by 2039. And we're going to do that together with you, New Hope. And our third strategic priority is to help the TAG establish Global Harvest Theological Seminary with doctoral programs just 30 kilometers outside of Dar es Salaam. 
Already the TAG has diploma programs in all six of our Bible colleges around the country. We have, a bachelor, we have bachelor degree programs in three of our six Bible colleges. Our master's degree programs have been up and going at Central Bible College uh, in Dodoma for almost 10 years now. And with the blessings of AGWM Africa, AGTS in Springfield, and the Association of Pentecostal Theological Education in Africa, with their blessings, we will establish doctoral programs in Tanzania. We believe that because all knowledge comes from Christ, higher education should not dampen our evangelistic zeal and church planting efforts. Rather, it should fuel our passion for reaching the laws and enlarge our vision for planting churches. Dr. Mtokambali has modeled this before us. He has two master's degrees and a doctorate. And he has planted more than 300 daughter churches from the church that he now pastors, a church that he planted in 1987. What he is doing at a local level, we are now doing at a national level. And we believe that students will become like their teachers and leaders. And that Christ calls our TAG teachers and elected leaders to lead by example. For that reason, no teacher can teach in any of our church planting schools and colleges unless that teacher is a church planter. And no pastor can serve in national, district, or, el or sectional elected positions unless the pastor, one, continues to pastor a church, and two, continues to plant other churches. It's about leading by example to reach Tanzania for Jesus. And our fourth strategic priority is to help our Tanzanian pastors plant churches in the villages of Tanzania. From Dar es Salaam, we will work with the TAG and its new startup church initiative called the Tawi Project. Currently, the TAG is growing at a rate of almost 1,000 churches per year. And the infrastructure of the TAG is not keeping up with the growth. About 70% of our churches in the villages are meeting in temporary structures under tarps, under tarps, and under trees. Some of these churches have been meeting in such conditions for as long as six years. Many of these pastors make less than $5 per month. They make less than $5 per month, and they have bigger families than ours. They have 8, 10, and 12 children, and they struggle to raise a crop in places like the Dodoma region the driest region in the country. I'm talking about pastors like Pastor Katema, who left his work as a minor to plant churches in the Islamic area of Kondoa, which Tanzanians call the Little Sudan of Tanzania. Katema would walk four days and three nights, one way to reach the villages of this region. Since the late 90s, in the Little Sudan of Tanzania, Pastor Katema has planted nine churches. He has planted these churches facing fierce opposition from Islamic leaders and attacks from wild animals. In the Muslim village of Chandama, three lions surrounded him as he slept under a tree. The village refused to allow him to sleep in Chandama because they knew that he wanted to plant a church among them. These very same lions attacked the villagers of Chandama, killing a small child. The villagers the village leaders feared that the evil spirits were punishing them for their mistreatment of Pastor Katema. So they went looking for him, calling out his name, thinking that the lions had probably killed him as well. But amazingly, as they went out into the African bush, out into the wilderness of Kondoa, Pastor Katema came walking up towards them. They told him what had happened and asked him if he had seen any lions in the night. He told them that he had not seen them, but that he remembered some dogs in the middle of the night sniffing him, but he was just too tired to wake up and run them off, so he curled up more and just continued to sleep. When they went to where Katema had slept, they did not find dog paw prints there, but they found lion paw prints all around where he slept. God had miraculously spared his life. It is a modern-day Daniel in the lion's den story. The Muslim leaders were so awestruck that they gave Pastor Katema a plot for a TAG church and a place to live in the village. Hallelujah. 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 We praise the Lord for that. And today, if you were to go with my family and me to the village of Chandama, 
you would find a vibrant TAG church in this little Muslim village of Chandama, and they are planting other churches as well. Pastor Katima represents the pastors partnering to build these churches. We are able to build these 15 by 25 foot startup churches, which will hold 60 to 100 Tanzanians. We're able to build them for just $1,500. These $1,500 startup churches will accommodate two and even three Sunday morning services until these churches have the resources to build larger church buildings. Some of these pastors are really struggling, and you can just imagine how helping these pastors with these new church buildings put wind in their sails. For those of us who have encountered financially difficult times, we know what an encouragement it is when somebody comes up and puts a 10 a 20 or a, even a $100 bill in our hand. Pursuing these four strategic priorities together, we will more strategically be engaged as a family in partnership with the TAG. And this will bring us, by embracing these four strategic priorities, these, this will bring us into greater strategic alignment with AGWM Africa and its lordship and lostness process. We are doing all that we are doing because in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, Christ calls us to be steadfast. He calls us, all of us, here in this room, here in this church, he calls us to be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing, knowing that our labor in the Lord, in the nasty here and now, is never in vain. You see, it's not about escaping this life to get on to our heavenly reward. It's about going into all the world to make disciples of the nations. It's about being salt and light in this world, proclaiming that Jesus is the victorious, exalted, resurrected, crucified Christ. It's about leaving boats and nets on the shoreline and mining equipment in the mountains to follow Christ. This morning, what boats and nets is Christ calling you to leave behind? I know that he's speaking to our hearts this morning. He is faithful. Luke 5.11 says that Peter left everything behind to follow Jesus. Everything. What does everything look like for you? Those of us who are in Christ, we are not fighting a losing battle, nor are we fighting to win the victory. Christ has already won the victory, and we live and breathe and move in that reality. To reach the nations. As one evangelist once said, if they wound me, God will heal me. If they kill me, he will raise me from the dead. We have absolutely nothing to fear. You see, we are called to live our lives bringing to the nations the victory that Christ accomplished on the cross. Christ is the resurrection and the life. And we are his resurrection people, filled with his life-giving spirit to reach the nations. In Christ, there is victory and there is hope because he is the victor over evil, sin, and death. Christ, he is the hope of the nations. Pastor Weaver, if you will come. He is the hope of the nations. And if we know Christ, we have his empowering presence within us. To go out into the darkness of our community, schools, families, families, and workplaces to bring to them the hope that we already have. But if we don't know Christ, we're lost. We're part of that darkness. And Christ this morning was to come and be your victor over evil, sin, and death. He wants to bring to your heart the hope that you so desperately need.